Are you okay if I announce that? Yeah, sure. Jeżeli chcesz, mo mogę ja teraz zrobić to, no, że jestem włączony już z tym nagraniem. Nie, ja mogę to robić, ja już no. jestem połączony. So, we start the beautiful day by an announcement. There will be the conference dinner today at 7 p.m. in the coffee room. So, to people who are not in the course, don't tell them so that there will be more food for the other people. <laughs> okay, but let's start uh, the third uh, uh, le uh, lecture of uh, the course of uh, John Chaiko from Utah University. <laughs> On, you didn't put the title. Yes. You promised to put your title. Some some arguments on equidistribution. Yes. Okay. Sorry that I didn't put my title. I do have some other things. Uh, just a reminder that my notes are on math.utah.edu/slash/tilda-jacob/impom. Slash okay. Uh, hours four and five of my lecture are going to be switched with hour six of my lecture. Um, or it just makes more sense to group two of them together. And so hour six, to be more specific, will be given on Monday. It will be an argument of Yves Couden that I like quite a lot. And arguments four and five will be Tuesday, where I have two lectures. Um, and it'll be an argument of uh, Ratner and Maser, which I like a lot. Um, but they're grouped together just because that made sense. There's one more change to announce. Um, organizing things is always a challenge. And the organizers have, to meet this challenge, they've switched my Wednesday talk at 10 with Martin Lepiel's Wednesday to uh, Thursday talk at 10. So I believe I'm speaking on, Thursday, on Wednesday at 10, and Martin's speaking on Thursday at 10. OK, so thank you for that. Today is Wednesday. This is next week. Ah, we didn't. Yeah. Thank you very much for that clarifying question. This is for next week, and it will probably be announced many times between now and then. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you all for coming, and the organizers for having me. This is the last um, talk I'm giving where I'm doing sort of basics of ergodic theory. Uh, and next week I'll switch to some arguments in horror spherical equidistribution. Okay, so I want to prove another ergodic theorem. So last class I proved the, von, the Birkhoff ergodic theorem. In this class I want to prove the von Neumann ergodic theorem. So let's do the statement. So as usual, uh, x comma u comma t is an ergodic Measure preserving system, uh, probability measure preserving system. Okay. Um, then uh, the summation one over n times the summation from i equals zero to n minus one of f composed with t to the i of x to the i uh, converges to the integral of f d mu in L2 more. And so maybe I'll clarify what I mean by this. Please tell me if this chalk is not view 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 viewable. Um, that is the limit, as capital N goes to infinity, of the L2 norm of 1 over n times the, times the summation from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of f of t to the i of x minus the integral of f d mu where this is the constant function whose constant value is f d mu, and L2 norm is equal to zero. Everyone happy about this? 
So we did a sort of pointwise ergodic theorem last class, the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, and here's a theorem about convergence and norm. Okay, so let's do the proof. Okay, so the proof is relies on sort of a good definition, uh, some good definitions. So proof. Let n. Uh, so the proof. Let u sub t. Have L two of mu to itself. Uh, by u sub t of f is equal to f t host with t. Note t preserves mu implies by a change of variables that u sub t is isometry. of the L2 norm. So now uh, let m be equal to the set of f in L2 so that u sub t of f is equal to f. So you should think of this as the L2 set of invariant functions. And let n be a different subspace equal to the set of all uh, u sub t of f of g minus g, so that g is in L2. So it's every function, and g, and this is every function that can be represented as uh, the image of something in ut subtracted from that original thing, co-boundaries, if you will. All right. So uh, let's now do our first claim. Uh, claim one. M is equal to the orthogonal complement of N. And just let's remember, so this is really just, this proof is really sort of an exercise in standard Hilbert space arguments. So let me just re remind you what that means. That is, M is equal to, it has a different description, and it's equal to exactly the set of all H, so that the inner product of H and um, let's say phi is equal to zero for all phi in n. Okay. So one direction is pretty straightforward. So uh, m is contained in n perp. This is pretty straightforward if we're looking at the inner product of uh, f And eight, uh, and let's say uh, g minus. Oh, sorry, let's do g minus u t of g. Sorry, it'll be more convenient for me to write it this way. G minus u t of g. So this is going to. I take the adjoint on both sides. So this is equal to f identity minus ut. So u, i is the identity operator minus ut of j. Okay, now I can take the adjoint. And so this is going to be i star minus oh, I guess I'm doing this. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I got confused. Sorry. I got this. N is contained in N perp. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. What I want to do is I want to look at F inner product with G minus U T of G. 
And this is the inner product of f with g. f with g minus um, the inner product of f with u t of g. Okay. And so this is going to be equal to zero. Because f is t and u t invariant. Sorry about that. So now let's do the next thing, which is the uh, little bit trickier, which is that n perp is contained in. So what do we have here? What we have is we have that f comma g minus u t of g is equal to zero for all g in L2. Okay. And as I was doing on the other side, I was reading the wrong lines, what we get is we get that uh, f minus ut star of f comma g is equal to zero for all g in L2. And this implies that f is equal to u t star. Everybody happy about this? Okay, so now the next step is uh, what this gives me is it gives me that f. So now I want to investigate f minus u t of f. And using normal Hilbert space things, I'm going to square this. And so this is going to be equal to f minus u t of f comma f minus u t of f. And then this simplifies into being 2 times the norm of f squared minus uh, u t star of f comma f. minus f comma u t star of f. Everybody happy about this? Who's with me at this point? But these are f. Everybody happy? So this now is zero. So f is actually ut invariant. So we use one contained to prove the other. So this is so it's easy to show this, right? Like, but this first like f scalar g minus ut g is does it come from the first proof, right? No, um. So this is what it means to be an n perp. Ah, so it's definition. Yeah, that, that's the definition of n perp. No problem. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Just to comment, so this is true for any uh, isomorphism, not just. Like, yeah, I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. So, any other questions? Yes. Uh, last time you proved the field work, which is usually considered hard, but actually I think that uh, by taking. Uh, some uh, cutoff of the function, you can use dominant convergence plus Vilkov to prove this, no? So I'm going to use von Neumann. I want to use von Neumann. It's got its own beautiful independent proof that's not as hard. Yes. And so I think it's worthwhile to do. Yeah, usually it's the other model. This is easier. This is easier, right? Because this is more general. Yes, yes, right. Okay. Okay, we, one can get into pedagogical arguments of whether I'm presenting things in the optimal way, but let's move on. Um, okay, so the next step I want to prove is that if f is in a closure, so now I have another claim, that if f is in the closure of n, then 1 over n, times the summation from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of uh, u sub t to the i of f is equal to 0. Okay. Everybody happy about this? 
So I should make a remark for context. <clears throat> so n is in the perp of n, but that doesn't mean that my Hilbert space is equal to m direct sum n, because it means that my Hilbert space is equal to n direct sum the closure of n. And what I want to do is I want to understand what these sums are doing on n and on another set, which together add up to being all of Hilbert space. So then I can use the linearity of this object to understand what it's doing on all of Hilbert space. So I need to pass from, the from n to its closure. Everybody? And maybe the choice of n as a number when the n is an operator is not so good. OK, that's a very good point. So maybe I should call this guy. Thank you very much for that. It's a great point. Um, OK. Uh, all right, so let's keep, so let's do this. Uh, Okay, so um, this is a pretty standard argument. Um, so if f is in the closure of n, then for all epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a g, you know, let's call it phi, which I guess could be g minus ut of g, which is in n. Right, that's what it means to be in the, and, sorry, and f minus g is less than x. Everybody happy about this? That's what it means to be in the closure. Uh, no, I'm lying to you. f minus phi. I mean, that's what it means to be in the closure. Hmm. Okay, so now what I can do is I can represent um, the norm of the summation from 1 over k. Thank you once again. K minus 1 of u sub t to the i of f. So that's going to be equal to the summation 1 over k. K minus 1 of u sub t to the i of b um, plus 1 over k times the summation of u t to the i. of uh, f minus i. And then I've got my last term. Which is the summation. Of u sub t to the i of g minus u sub t. Everybody happy about this? I'm just using the triangle inequality. So um, that uh, are there any questions on what I've written? See. Seeing more confusion than I expected, so I'll talk through the sum ends quickly. So I want to get. I'm sorry, not one over n, one over k. Yes. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So now let's study our terms. So this term here is a telescoping sum. And so what's it equal to? It's equal to g minus ut to the k of g. Because all of, them, even, all of the other terms cancel out. So if i is equal to 1, this is ut of g. And here I had a term coming from i equals to 0, so I get a minus a ut of g, and that cancels out. So those all cancel out by telescoping sum, and I just have these two terms. Everybody OK with that? And so the norm of this is less than or equal to twice the norm of g. You're just using that u is an isometry, so its powers are an isometry as well. Okay. This term here is going to be small. This term is less than or equal to the norm of uh, f minus phi. Less than. I'm sorry. Less than or equal. 
less than or equal to, thank you very much, less than or equal to f minus phi. And let's talk through why that is. So inside here, the norm of this is just f minus phi. This, e, this, is an, this is an isometry, so all of these terms have norm f minus phi. There's, I'm adding up k of them. The norm of that is at most k times that. I'm dividing by k. Everybody happy about this? Okay. And now I'm in business to use this term, and we have the same argument here. So this is less than or equal to twice the norm of g. Everybody okay with this? Okay, so now I'm basically done at this point. So observe uh, the summation from i equals zero to k, one over k of u sub t to the i of f is equal to f for all f and m. And so what's our conclusion now? So let f and L2 of mu be arbitrary. Let f and L2 of mu be arbitrary. So f is now equal to some g plus h, where g is an m. And h is in the ortho complement of m, which is equal to n bar, the closure of m. Everybody happy about this? So now we have that 1 over n times the summation, 1 over k times the summation from i equals 0 to k minus 1 of u sub t to the i of f is equal to 1 over k times the summation from i equals 0 to k minus 1 of u sub t to the i of g plus the same thing for h. Is this being blocked here, or am I free to write up to this point? Okay, u sub t to the i of h. Now this term here goes to 0. And this term here is just equal to g the whole time. And because these sets are orthogonal, so we have that this converges in L2 norm to projection onto the m. The moral, the limit in L2 of uh, 1 over k times the summation of i equals 0 to k minus 1 of u sub t to the i of f is equal to projection onto m. Orthogonal projection of f onto m. Okay, everybody happy about this? Now because m is the, because I'm ergodic, this is exactly the constant functions. Uh, I'm ergodic. T comma mu is ergodic. M equals the set of constant functions. And orthogonal projection is given by integrating. And that's just by the definition of the inner product. Any questions on this? Uh, sorry, and then you need the elasticity of mu. You know? I'm assuming ergodicity of mu. So let me try and maybe try and answer your question. If I don't assume it's ergodic, so if I erase this word I've written, mm -hmm. what we get is that it's orthogonal projection onto the uh, invariant functions. But if I'm ergodic, I know what that is. That's the set of constant functions. And I know what orth... But this limit exists. exists. It's a function. No? Or no? <clears throat> if you only have a invariance and... Correct. It's, pro it's still orthogonal projection onto M. Exactly. 
which are the constant functions. So the limit is going to be some other object. It's not going to be the integral. It's going to be something else, right? And that's going to be the orthogonal projection of f onto the constant functions, whatever those are. Am I answering your question? I don't. Yeah. Okay. My constant here in the variable under q. No, I mean constant. Like it's just the constant function equal to the constant. If it's not ergodic, then it's invariant. Did I say, uh, sorry if I misspoke. Sorry if I misspoke. Thank you for pointing that out if I misspoke. Um, any other questions? Did I clear up all confusion or have I created greater confusion <laughs> at this point? Okay. Um, okay, so now let's do one last topic that's really designed to prepare for um, next uh, set of lectures, which is talking a little bit about irrational rotations of the circle and a couple of the results I need about that. So I want to define a space here. So um, what my space is going to be. So I have the real numbers, and this is an abelian group under addition, and it's got a normal subgroup, which is the integers, and so that's going to be what my space is going to be. Okay? And I can think of the space as being a circle with circumference 1. And moreover, I can identify it with the interval 0, 1, um, modulo 1. So, uh, so this is a circle. As I'm going towards 1, 1 and 0 are identified, so I'm actually going close to 0 again. Everybody okay with this? And so it's got a distance on it, which is the minimum of the usual distance between two points, and 1 minus that distance between two points. And so what I want to prove is the following proposition. Um, if alpha is an irrational number and r sub alpha maps r mod z to itself by r alpha of x is equal to x plus alpha, then R alpha is ergodic with respect to Lebesgue measure. Okay. I should mention this is a minor abuse of notation. This plus is the plus in the group R mod Z. Is everyone happy with this statement? So in particular, I'm identifying with this with the 0, 1 interval. So Lebesgue measure is Lebesgue measure on the 0, 1 interval. All right, so let's prove this. Um, so we need the following theorem. So the proof uses the following theorem. Uh, the functions. e to the 2 pi i x uh, kx k in the integers form an orthonormal basis for L2 of the big measure. Okay, everybody happy about this? Classical result. Um, goes beyond the scope of my mini course. So now let's prove the theorem using this. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to prove that if, so we will show that 
is uh, F is an L2 of mu. And F is equal to F composed with R alpha, then F is constant as an L2 function. Okay, and constant just means it has a constant value almost everywhere. All right, uh, so F is equal to uh, the summation of n and the integers of the inner product of f with u sub t, oh, e to the 2 pi i n. Okay. Multiply by e to the 2 pi i. Uh, let's see y. Everyone happy about this? So this is just because this set forms an orthonormal basis, and that's true for any orthonormal basis. Everyone okay with this? Great. Okay, so now F can pose with rotation by alpha. Uh, let's give this a name. Let's give this a name. Uh, let's call it A sub n. Why not? So this is the summation of n and z of uh, a sub n again, and now it's e to the 2 pi i y here. But rather than y, this is going to be y plus alpha, because I'm rotating by alpha. Everybody happy about that? Okay, great. So now this is equal to the summation of n and the integers of a sub n times e to the 2 pi i n alpha times e to the 2 pi i n one. So let's give these guys a name. Let's call this guy star. Let's call this guy smiley face. Why not? Okay. So if star is equal to smiley face, then either, then for n each n, either a sub n is equal to zero, or e to the two pi i n alpha is equal to one. So how do these expressions differ? They differ because one of them has an e to the two pi i n alpha in them, and the other one doesn't. So if there's two possibilities, well, it could just be zero, and then it doesn't matter what you're multiplying by, or you could be multiplying by one, okay? And those are the two possibilities, okay? So now, when is an expression like this equal to zero? It's exactly that if n alpha is an integer, I'm sorry, when is an expression like this equal to one? It's exactly when n alpha is an integer. And if alpha is irrational, that never happens. So, uh, uh, no, it, it happens when n is zero, sorry. Um, so, uh, if alpha is irrational, it is not in q. Uh, e to the 2 pi i n alpha is equal to 1 if and only if n equals 0. So, uh, if smiley's face equals star, then a sub n is equal to zero for all n not equal to zero. Right. And so I'm a constant function. So f is constant. With value a sub zero. Everybody happy about this? It's a value proof, isn't it? I don't know the history of this proof. It's, it's a classic argument. So the theorem is due to Weil, I believe, uh, in like 1918 or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, I don't know who the proof is due to, but the theorem is. 
All right, any other questions? Cool. So now I want to prove something that's almost weaker from what I formally said. It requires just a tiny, yeah. So I want to prove the following proposition. that more or less was proved by Reynolds before. So uh, if alpha is irrational, then for every x, the set r to the alpha times alpha x. I in the integers is this. Okay. So let me make this. So this is kind of an absurd result to be proving this way because once I've established ergodicity, the Birkhoff ergodic theorem says that for any fixed interval, almost every hit point hits that interval not only infinitely often but with frequency predicted by the length of that subinterval. And so using this, you can rather easily show that ergodicity proves that the orbit of almost every point is dense. And I'm in an isometry, so it doesn't require much work to upgrade that to every point. Pedagogically, I'm doing this because I want to highlight three different arguments next week. And one of those arguments, upgrades, will be cast to, f to upgrade density to unique ergodicity for uh, rotations. That's one way of sort of thinking about this argument. And so pedagogically, I want to present this to sort of motivate the fact that the assumption used in this argument of Kuden is, um, the argument used is, is the upgrade really has significance. Okay, so that's the kind of pedagogical motivation. All right, everyone okay with that? Okay, let's. Get going. Okay, so let's now do uh, a proof. So this proof relies on the following lemma. For every epsilon bigger than zero, there is an n. So that zero is less than the distance from r to the n alpha of x x, which is less than epsilon. Okay, so that's this lemma. And let me, um, I'll skip the proof of this lemma. So let me mention that this is almost what um, Reynolds proved in his talk when he was proving Dirichlet's theorem. So proof idea. Uh, n can be chosen to be less than, less than or equal to 1 over epsilon. Let's do a C function. Okay. And see the argument. Uh, the argument is the same as Reynolds. Proof. Same exact pigeonhole principle. The only issue is you sort of want to multiply through by your number uh, by, by this n. It's also in the notes, so you can check the notes here if you want to see it. Right. So now we're almost done. Okay. So proof of proposition. to um, the distance of x comma r to the n of x, where um, 
the distance of x comma y to the n of x is less than epsilon. Everyone happy about this? I'm just now, I was given this particular thing, and now I'm picking the size of the actual distance to be r. And now what I want to do is I want to consider the set r to the, uh, let's say, k n of x for k equals 0 to the ceiling function of 1 over r. Okay. And let's think about what's happening here. I'm starting on the circle. I'm starting at some point x here. And I'm taking steps of size r. Okay. And I repeat this. And I do this 1 over r times. Okay. So I cover the whole circle. And I get back close to where I started by steps of size r. And so the gap between each of these is at is at most r. Okay. And so the so this is going to be at r and this is going to be r and so epsilon does. Okay. So I'm on a circle. I'm taking steps of size of a given size r at each step, and I'm going so far that I've gone at least distance the circumference of the circle. So every point now lands between gaps with whose size is at most r. Happy about this? Okay. Uh, any questions? Okay. So now I'm done with the proposition. Since epsilon was arbitrary, since I could by the lemma do this for any epsilon, my set is dense. So the set of r to the n x n equals 0 to infinity is bits. Because a subset of it, where I'm doing these steps, is, ep is epsilon dense for any epsilon. OK, so now I want to move on and discuss another context. Okay. So let's do a related space to this, this space we did before. Let's go up one dimension. So let's do r squared minus z squared, which is the torus, the two torus. Perfectly nice situation, once again, an abelian group, a subgroup. And we can even think about this kind of as the following. So you can identify it with 0, 1 squared. So you could imagine this to maybe be a dotted line. And so what you can do is you can think of identifying this side to this side, and this side up here. is identified to this side down here. Because okay. any point sitting here is identified to a point here by the map by adding 0, 1, which is something in the integer lattice. And any point here is identified to its parallel point over here by adding 1, 0, something in the lattice. So they're the same in this space. And then what I want to do is I want to consider, I want to pick a vector, v, in R2. See this vector here. And I want to define a flow on this space. So I want to define the flow in direction v on this space. in direction v on r2 my, um, my torus. 
And so how am I going to define it? I'm going to define it as ft v of a point in this torus, a comma b, is equal to a comma b plus v t times v. Where once again, this is the addition in the group. And in particular, if you think of as v as being v1 plus v2, I'm sorry, v1 comma v2, this is going to be equal to a plus t v1 comma b plus t v2. All right. And then, so, um, uh, the ne I next want to make a couple of remarks. Remarks or observations. And so the first observation is B that F of 1 over V2 sends horizontal lines to the same horizontal line. <coughs> horizontal lines to themselves. V1 here, 1 over V2 here, and V2 t times 1 over V2 is 1. And so this differs uh, from A comma B by something in the first coordinate, let's not worry about that, plus comma B plus, uh, it, and then a 1 in the second coordinate. So that's the same thing as B in the second coordinate in my group. Everybody okay with that? Great. Okay, and now so f of v of 1 over v2 acts by rotation by v1 over v2 on the second coordinate, on the first coordinate. Everybody happy about this? So we have the following corollary to the proposition here, which is that if v1 over v2 is an irrational number, then for every a and b, times k over v2. And that's going to act on a given horizontal line by rotation of v1 over v2, which I'm assuming is irrational. So that's going to be dense in my horizontal line. Okay? And now I want to free myself up to let my time parameter vary continuously, and that's going to send, move me through the horizontal lines. So I first showed that my orbit is dense in a given horizontal line, but then by letting my time parameter vary, I'm, that implies I'm dense in every horizontal line, because the flow trajectory will intersect each horizontal line. Okay. So I want to wrap this up by, for completeness, making some definitions.
definitions. Okay, uh, let x have a b uh, be a measurable space. A flow is a family of T of X to itself so that two conditions are satisfied. F of T plus S is equal to F of t composed with f of s. So it obeys a nice kind of composition law, and then we need some measurability to be met. The map that sends t comma x to f to the t of x is measurable as a map from, uh, from x comma b. Across uh, R comma or L, or L sigma L. Okay. A flow is called measure preserving um, is measure preserving. Preserves mu. If um, for all a in my sigma algebra b and t in the reals, uh, the measure of f to the minus t of a is equal to the measure of a. And then lastly, it's ergodic. Uh, it is mu ergodic. If, once again, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume it's measure preserving. difference f to the minus t of a equals zero for all uh, t in the reals implies that a has either full measure or co-full measure. Okay, so that's the definition of ergodic. Maybe I'll quotes around the... So up until this point, sort of for clarity, for kind of simplicity of exposition, everything was done discreetly. In my next lectures, we're going to be moving ourselves into the continuous setting. Well, I'm sorry, into the flow setting, where all of these will be our actions, and we'll be considering in particular these particular flows on the torus for particular choices. Okay. And that will be the next five lectures. Thank you. Question. Uh, so here, the definition of uh, flow, you don't assume topological space, uh, so you don't assume continuity with respect to T. Everything, cor correct, but everything will be done in the next five lectures will be things like this. So the setting will actually be considered are extremely nice maps of extremely nice compact metric spaces. Another question? If not, so, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
with, with Scotland.